Freedom Express tonight, a conversation that has become necessary as a group of people begin to provoke discussions as to what really are their rights in a country like Ghana. But does Ghana have a stance on matters concerning lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, plus? Does it conform with our customs as a country? What does the future look like with this phenomenon staring us in the face? So, LGBT debate, what is Ghana's official position on this? There's mounting pressure on President Ekufuadu to shut down an office being operated in Accra by the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer intersex rights movement in Ghana and there's been a lot of controversy. The opening of that office has reignited the conversation about what Ghana's position is on LGBTQI. That National Coalition for Proper Human Sexual Rights and Family Values is leading this campaign and its leader, Fua Mwening, describes its existence as illegal and an affront to the laws, traditions and customs of the country. Now, there are concerns because the Catholic Bishops Conference joined that call a few days ago demanding the president to shut down that office as a matter of urgency. Guess which people have joined uh, the fight? Today, the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council is throwing its weight behind the National Coalition for Proper Human Sexual Rights and Family for the LGBTQI plus office to be shut down. And uh, GPCC has a number of demands. The Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council, one, wants all diplomats who played a part in the opening of the LGBTQI plus to be summoned by the president to explain their violation of the sovereignty of Ghana. It also wants parliament to summon ministers of foreign affairs and the interior minister to explain what actions have so far been taken in relation to this matter. It supports a comprehensive legislation to deal with LGBT issues once and for all and to settle any future controversy. That's according to the Ghana uh, Pentecostal and Charismatic Council. Now, journalists against the LGBTQI plus Ghana have also issued a statement today and they've been talking about this thing. They want government to declare two diplomats, Australian High Commissioner to Ghana and Danish Ambassador to Ghana as persona non grata. And they say they are the two funding the community space as a result of the LGBTQ group hosting them as fundraisers on January 31, 2021. That uh, journalists say they are casting doubts on a story circulating that President Ekufuado has directed the closure of the LGBTQ office, adding their checks reveal the office is located within the precinct of the Australian ambassador's official residence. Let's look at some uh, responses we've had in uh, the few days as this conversation kick-started. Kojo Ponkroma, who is the Minister Designate for Information at his vetting recently, proposed a legislation against the advocacy of LGBT activities. He continues to say, given the current advocacy around the legalization of homosexuality in the country, the country needs to consider passing a law that tackles its promotion because the practice in itself is culturally unacceptable and goes contrary to section 104 of the Criminal Act, 1960, Act 29. And this is the law we'll be interrogating tonight because there are many who feel our laws do not capture adequately this kind of activities. What does uh, section 104 of the Criminal Offenses Act say? We'll be getting into that shortly. And Minister-designate for Gender and Social Protection-designate, also uh, Adwa Safo, at her vetting expressed disapproval over the legalization of homosexuality in Ghana. So these are issues that will be interrogating vis-a-vis -vis 
government's posture what does the law say how does the public feel about this phenomenon what actually is our official stance on this matter i'll introduce to you my guest after this break Are you live on PM Express and we're discussing LGBTQI debate and we're asking if Ghana has an official position. John Indebrugui is a private legal practitioner. He'll be joining me shortly. Reverend Dr. Cyril Gishon Fayose Kwao is General Secretary of the Christian Council of Ghana. Sheikh Arume Al Shaibu is a Muslim cleric and spokesperson for the National Chief Imam. Right Reverend Samuel Noy, Men's Science Member of the National Executive Council of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council. Frank Doi is Acting Country Director of Amnesty International. And uh, Ignatius Anno is journalist with Euronews and pro-LGBTQI activist. Before we get into the discussion, let's get a personal story from Ignatius Anno. Ignatius, I'm grateful for your time. So you have never said this anywhere. This is the first time you're speaking about this. Tell us your story in Ghana before you left the country. Well, Ansha, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on such an issue that has been controversial for centuries, and we all know the reasons why. Uh, I want to say this on record. I know for some people who are seeing me through this very lens, um, it might sound a bit contradictory, and that's because in the past, I had denied my truth. I had denied the fact that I was gay. And I did that because of the fear of losing my career. You know, at the time, I practiced broadcast journalism in Ghana for, for a number of years. And being on TV and being out at uh, brought a lot of pain to my life. Um, one that you would have to live within the members of my body to understand. So much so that it got to a point I returned to Ghana from uh, studying in the UK, looking for a job at uh, the media houses that I wanted to work with in Ghana and nobody was ready to give me a job. And that's just because of the stigma that surrounds uh, my community. So this is going to be the very first time that I'm using your medium to say that not only am I an activist for the rights of um, Africa's sexual minorities, what you will call the LGBTQI community, but I am gay. It is a truth that I've accepted and it is a truth that I live by. And so just to answer your question, because I was outed as a gay person, and obviously I denied it because I was afraid of losing my job. I was working at an incredible television station in a car, and also for the fear of what would happen to me personally. Um, I can share stories about people that have been attacked just because they are seen to be a particular way, and I didn't want that to happen to me. So uh, I would also want to use your medium to say and apologize to the people that my community that I've let down over the years simply because I didn't have the courage to own my truth and live it as somebody who was, uh, you know, uh, in, in the media. Ignacio, but, so how does it feel like uh, being in the midst of all the public anger towards your sexuality? It's, it's, um, it's very sad. It doesn't feel okay. Uh, I'm speaking to you right now and I can't even feel the fear and the anxiety within my heart. That's, that's, that's the feeling for LGBTQI people because you're not allowed to openly say who you are or even love on who you want to love on or have that kind of love reverted to you as well. So it doesn't feel okay. It doesn't feel like, you know, uh, I'm a human being who deserves uh, the right to employment, the right to education, and 
literally the basic right to uh, be able to walk, drive around, go to wherever that I want to go to in Ghana as an openly gay man. It doesn't feel okay. It feels dehumanizing and awful. So what do you hope should happen in Ghana's contest? You know, what my community is asking for is the opportunity to love like, you know, all humanity love, well, particularly in the case of Ghana, heterosexuals. The privilege that heterosexuals have, that you cannot, you know, out yourself to say you're gay and be allowed to live. My hope is that what I call draconian laws that have been passed down by colonizers, which gradually, you know, uh, well, in the West, we all know those, those, those laws do no longer exist. Those laws will be scrapped out of the books of the Republic of Ghana so that people like myself who uh, have life, who work, contribute to the socioeconomic fiber of the Republic of Ghana, but be accepted as human beings deserving of respect, kindness, and dignity. I'm grateful for your time. Ignatius Anno is uh, a journalist with Euronews, and he is an LGBTQ activist, and he's actually accepted on this platform that not only is he an activist, but he is a gay um, himself. Um, no, no. Um, I'm not going to cut you, but uh, I want Ghanaians to have an honest conversation about people who live in your family, people who are your brothers, are your sisters, are your uncles, are your cousins. Like myself, I do have family in Ghana, that you will see that these are human beings that deserve to have the very life that you have and be able to be free and go about their normal activities. How like does you your do. family feel about this, um, Ignatius? Well, um, you know, 2017, when I came back to Ghana from studying, I had a burning desire to um, tell my truth. And I thought I needed to speak to my mother about it, first of all, because she's my only surviving parent. And what is funny is that she looked me in the eye and said to me, just because according to her at the time, this is January the 30th telling me that, oh, just yesterday she was listening to a preacher on the radio talking about how demonic it is to be a man and have love for your fellow man or be a woman and have love for your fellow woman. And so she was going to pray to cast that demon away from me. And to hear that from my mother was very painful, but then I gave grace because I understand you know, the context. I understand where she was coming from. That's not her idea. It is what has repeatedly been fed into the minds and ultimately the hearts of people. So my mom, even three years ago, was not accepting of it and told me that, I remember the following day she came back to me to say, I have not been able to sleep because of what you've told me. And I could feel her pain because she thought I was going to put my life in danger for what others have faced. And particularly TV person and being suspected of being gay but not openly saying it and I remember telling her she should forget I said that to her and I said that so that she could have the peace that she needs but you know at 32 years old today I've lived a, a life of lie I've lived a double life and no human being deserves to do that and to have accepted that truth and lived the freedom that I live today. Mm. I'm, very, I'm a very content person and, today. And your mother, your mother, your mother has come to terms with that, right? I will, not, I will not say that because, like I told you, in 2017 when I, I told her, uh, she said she was going to pray for me and I told her that she should forget I ever had this conversation and we've never spoken about it about again. again. Life has gone on. I'm grateful for your time, Ignatius. Um, uh, Anno, uh, who is a journalist with Euronews and also um, an activist for L um, gay rights, and he's accepted that he's gay himself, but because of circumstances... I, don't, I'm sure, I really don't mind staying along uh, for the conversation. Okay, that's really fine. Mind. That's fine. So let me bring in uh, Sheikh Arimeo Shaibu here. He's a spokesperson for the national chief imam, he's a Muslim cleric as, as well. Sheikh, I have so far seen a number of statements 
from the Christian-based organizations condemning the act and giving specific recommendations as to how this should be handled. I am yet to hear from the national chief imam or the Muslim ummah. Does your silence mean support for LGBTQI activities in Ghana? No, I mean to the contrary. Uh, like everybody knows, um, Islam has an unequivocal uh, position, I mean, uh, regarding the um, gay, um, lesbianism, or LGBTQI, uh, and all, the, all those things. Um, the position of Islam is very, very clear, uh, from both from the Quranic uh, point of view, but probably why you have not heard from the Muslim community is for us to put our facts um, together. For example, <clears throat> we wanted to hear what is this, what is the state um, saying about the outdooring of the office? Because this is, this is the first time this issue has come up. Secondly, there are state institutions that are also in charge of some of these things. For example, the Minister of Gender is one of the ministries that we expect to hear uh, from. So it can feed into what we want to put um, in the public domain. We also wanted to hear from the Ministry of Religion and Culture, uh, because this is the, uh, the ministry that has been put together to preserve and maintain our uh, national identity as, as, as a state. Um, uh, there, there are values that make us distinct from members of citizens of other countries. Mm. And so therefore, this is a ministry that we expected that will come and say, both from religious point of view and from the cultural point of view. Mm. Um, and then we also have, um, we have a president uh, who would also want to speak to the issue. Uh, once we did not hear these things coming up, we, we just wanted to be a little bit cautious and then get our, our facts right, then we uh, can come out. But we have begun participation in the public debate and public discourse about it. And this morning I was in, on one of the stations. Mm -hmm. Now I am with you. And Islam stands completely unequivocally opposed to any unnatural approach to sex, including all the other orientations, that is the, the L, the G, the B, the T, the Q, the I, and all the pluses that, uh, uh, for us, is a very dangerous uh, trend. It is anti-natural order. It is anti-family. It confronts God's own, you know, natural scheme uh, of things. And to allow it to go is to undermine the very sanctity of the family and the, and the, and the principle of God in procreation. Mm. Um, and so it, it's something that, from a religious point of view, we completely uh, stand opposed to. And if an office has been established, if it is true, we join the voices of all those who have indicated their opposition and have called on the government to, as a matter of agency, cause the closure of that office. I can appreciate the problem with Ignatius. Um, um, where he came from, he was not born, uh, when he was born, he, he was not born to be a gay, but after some experience, he began to feel this. So that feeling, that feeling that he has in him is what we see from a religious point of view as perverted and that he, he deserves to be assisted. I mean, he's, he's drifted into a, a domain of life which uh, is uh, sinful from our point of view um, and he, he, he needs to be, to be assisted out. Um, and so I, I like the view of his mom who was empathetic and said, well, uh, she has a son and she has a love for his for her son and she said look i'm going to um pray for you um that prayer for me is not a bad thing we have to pray for such all people who have become enslaved to the forces of the carnal self to the point that they can get to the other uh, uh, i mean the same sex um which undermines the very dignity which god associates with, with, with sex let me bring in right Reverend Samuel Neumann, sir, because he's a member of the National Executive Council of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council, who have issued a statement today asking for a number of things from government. So you want all diplomats who played a part in opening of that office sermon, 
and you want ministers of foreign affairs and interior also summoned to explain exactly what well thank you very much aisha and um, and thank you very much for the panel of members who are there the point is to explain um what probably was the rationale for supporting this lgbtq uh, action in ghana and um, how come as foreigners, uh, diplomat, diplomats, they would come to Ghana and violate our sovereignty and then decide to force a kind of a lifestyle that does not suggest the kind of lifestyle we are subscribed to. And of course, the minister of, uh, or the minister designate, um, I think she also expressed her disgust about this whole thing. So the Ghana Pentecostal Council is suggesting that government should look into this. And uh, not only that, but it is because of our values and because of our customs in this country and the, our traditional you know, system do not support this system of uh, lifestyle, including our laws of, in the country do not also support this kind of lifestyle. We strongly believe that in the beginning of God's creation, you know, uh, the scripture tells us that God created a male and a female. I appreciate the situation that Ignatius is in. Uh, the, we, will, we, we don't hate those kind of people, but we love them. We love them, and uh, we will do everything possible to see how best they can, they can come out of this kind of lifestyle. But the scripture tells us, in the beginning, God created a male and a female. God did not create Adam and Adam's sin. God did not create Eve and, uh, uh, and uh, Evelyn. But God created Adam and Eve. And you know, in life, if you don't know the use for a, uh, of a thing, you will always abuse it. If I should hand over to you a device, Aisha, which you have never, ever seen in your life before, it is natural that if you attempt to use it, you will damage that particular device. But there are two ways by which you can appreciate the use of that device and understand the purpose of that device. It is either through the manufacturer's manual or you will figure it yourself. If you figure it yourself, you will damage it. Now, you didn't create yourself. I didn't create myself. So how can I tell myself the reason and the purpose for which I was created? There is a higher being that created you. And the only way to understand the reason and the purpose of your creation is to go back to the manufacturer's manual. In the Christian faith is the Bible. That tells us the original intention of the creation of man and woman, that they will produce children you know, after their kind. And therefore, we strongly believe that anyone who does not come through the window, who does not come through the door, but goes through the window, the, time, the Bible tells us it's a thief and a robber. The only entrance into the world by human being is through the front passage. And Ignatius should be able to tell us whether human beings have ever come up through the back passage before. The only way human beings are born into the world is through the front passage. Anything at the back passage is irrational, is abnormal, and is something that has to be corrected. That is why the Ghana Pentecostal Council and Charismatic Council strongly believe that government should really make a position and a statement on this. Reverend Farisi, um, I know you're there, but are your concerns different from that of the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council? Not, not at all. Good evening. Sorry, I I was not listening because the phone was uh, cut. So uh, it's not not any different. We are on the same page. In fact, the entire Christian community and even the religious community are on the same page. We we believe that homosexuality is uh, not natural. It is pervasive, it's an abomination. In simple terms, it's a sin and must not be condoned in any way whatsoever. Now, um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Frank uh, Doi is the uh, country director, the executive uh, director for country director for uh, Amnesty International. I remember that uh, the, in 2018, UN expert report on Ghana. Uh, there was a, a report like that that indicated that LGBT people are discriminated against on the job market. And the UN rapporteur 
recommended a number of um, gave a number of recommendations and let me read a part of it it says Ghana government should decriminalize consensual same-sex conduct and act swiftly to protect LGBT people from discrimination intimidation and violence now Ghanaian authorities should also engage in a constructive dialogue with the LGBT population to better understand its needs and ensure they are protected by labor laws and anti-discrimination policies. What would shutting down the LGBTI plus uh, office, for instance, mean to Ghana's human rights record? Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, I've been listening to my senior colleagues from the Christian community and the Islamic community. And um, it is quite clear to me that when you look at the issue of LGBTI from a religious perspective, or even from a cultural perspective, you are likely to, to maintain a position that will not create a balanced discussion of, of, of the matter. Now, listening to Ignatius, one thing that jumped at me, I mean, one thing that came up quite clearly mm -hmm. is the element of discrimination. And Aisha, from what you just read, you know, from the UN, discrimination is what we, as a human rights organization at Amnesty International, are against. That people in the LGBTI community must not be discriminated against because of who they are, precisely because of our understanding of what human rights are. We believe, and I would like to believe that all other people believe that human rights are inherent. They are inborn. And so when we continue to use constructions and, 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 and suppositions and assumptions in a way that is delegatory to people of that community, then clearly we are violating their dignity. We have said, time with that number from Amnesty International, that we do not actively promote or encourage people you know, in that particular act. But then we do not also believe that it is something that people deliberately, or all people deliberately decide to engage in. And because of our understanding of human rights and human dignity, which is guaranteed in our constitution, our position has always been this, that because they are human and because our constitution and Article 15, Clause 1, clearly states that human dignity is invaluable. You know, the dignity of all persons, all persons underlined, is invaluable. And so because of that, people must not be discriminated against because of who they are. For instance, you know, Amnesty International campaigns for the right to education, the right to health, the right to sanitation, the right to adequate housing, and so on and so forth. These are fundamental human rights that our own constitution guarantees for all citizens. And so nobody should be discriminated against or should be denied the enjoyment of these fundamental human rights and freedoms simply because of who they are. And that has been Amnesty International, that even though we don't go about telling people or encouraging people or supporting people to be in that community, we are very, very certain that it is important that we protect their fundamental human rights. Right, it is clear, Aisha, from the commentaries mm -hmm. that you presented earlier, from the beginning up to the statement of our honorable Minister of Information, my good friend, uh, Mr. Koju Opon Nkrumah, it is clear that up until this time, Ghana doesn't have a clear position on the subject matter. And so all that people are saying is our culture, our religion, our values, our norms, which we respect. 
as Amnesty International because we believe that our culture is very important. But culture basically explained is the way a group of people live. But Ghana has you know, the laws. Way they eat, the way they Ghana talk, has and laws. They must not be discriminated. Mr. Doi, Ghana, Ghana has are. laws. If they have done something, Mr. Doi, and the lawyers will tell you that Section 104 of the Criminal Offenses Act 1960, Act 229, uh, speaks loudly to this issue about unnatural that, canal knowledge, which is criminal you, in Ghana. Thank you very much, um, Aisha, for that. I, we are very familiar with that provision in the law. And so our position is this. If an individual or a group of persons are found to be engaged in any criminal act, then the same law that frowns or that forbids that particular act also provides for sanctions. And there is a process and there is a procedure. And so even in the event that someone in that community engages in an act that violates our laws, the law provides for how that person must be treated. The law does not allow for discrimination because our constitution is clear on non-discrimination. The law does not allow for that person to be denied any of his basic fundamental human rights or freedom. So Aisha, the issue is clear as far as Amnesty International is concerned. If anybody, whether in the LGBT community or in a religious circle or in a cultural setting, violates any of our laws, then that person must be taken through the due process of law. The person must not be subjected to degrading, inhumane, cruel treatment because of who he is or because of who she is or because of who they are in that community because they are human. And our constitution recognizes that because they are human, they have dignity. That dignity must not be taken away from them because of who they are and because of how we see them. That is critically important that we all must ensure that the dignity of all persons are protected, promoted, and fulfilled at all times. If they go contrary to the law, process is quite clear what should be done and we expect that the right thing must be done instead of you know abusing their basic rights simply because of who they are and i must say this very quickly because before i am mis misinterpreted or misplaced in terms of my presentation on behalf of amnesty international and amnesty international ghana we do recognize that our programs and activities and campaigns and actions must be in conformity of our laws. And we do respect our laws. Mm. Issues about LGBTI are not the main focus of Amnesty International Ghana, but we do react when we observe that the fundamental rights and the dignity of such individuals are being violated. Then that becomes a concern to us as a human rights organization. Mm. And just as we fight for all other Ghanaians, be they Christians or Muslims or African traditional believers or Hindus, whatever persuasions or religion or political affiliation they may have, Amnesty's concern is solely on the impartial protection of their fundamental human rights. And we do the same. We do the same for people in the LGBT community. We do not. We do not support any form of discrimination at all, even though we do not encourage people and we do not support people and we do not encourage people to do things that may be contrary to our laws and our culture and our religious beliefs and practices. We respect our laws and we expect all citizens to respect and to abide by our laws just as we expect the state to protect the right of all without discrimination. Okay. That is very important to us. Right. Uh, let me read to you um, a, a statement issued by the, um, it says it's a journalist against LGBTQ plus Ghana. 
and they said we wish to request government to declare two diplomats as persona non grata as a result of their involvement in funding the community space of the lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, and uh, the two diplomats, Australian High Commissioner um, and the Danish Ambassador, have been accused of funding the community space as a result of the LGBTQ group hosting them as fundraisers on January 31, 2021. How does this kind of thing come across to you? We have admitted that our laws do not accept these kinds of things. Do we accept people who sponsor such activities in the country? Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, unless and until we are able to establish clearly that the people in the LGBT community are engaging in criminal acts, or that they have done things you know, that are contrary to our laws, it will be very difficult for Amnesty International, for example, to accept that call from that group of journalists that okay. we respect so much. Okay. Because anyone who supports any act of criminality must be dealt with according to law. Great. But now, at the moment, mm. we cannot say for sure or for certain that, our, let me say, that our brothers and sisters in the LGBT community have engaged in any criminal act, for which reason any kind of support for them might warrant you know, that kind of action that is being called for. After all, we all receive funding from the same institutions, individuals, Groups, organizations, institutions, no, no, no. even some religious organizations. If you, if you, if you talk and, and about the they not acting okay. in any criminal, um, engaging in any criminal activities, I'm sure you're aware that there are people who have been arrested for um, engaging in unnatural canal knowledge who are in cells, in prisons right now. So it makes oh, it okay. criminal. So if you say they've not engaged in any criminal activity, what are you talking about? Thank you very much, Aisha. So we need to separate the issues. If we box everything together, we might lose, excuse me, say, our sense of balance and mm. fairness. Mm. You know, if, if people have been, quote unquote, arrested for clearly violating the provision of law, then the law must deal with them. Okay. You know, mm. but we can't put all people together. For example, our understanding of gay rights is their entitlement for legal or to civil and legal, you know, rights of not to be discriminated against. Great. That is now our understanding. Okay. And so, so mm. unless the individuals have been identified, maybe to be publicly, publicly engaging in an act that offends our public sensibility mm. or our culture yeah. or our religion mm. and especially our laws mm. that we cannot say that they are criminals. Great. It now, section, let, let me... what people do behind closed doors, mm. what people do in their rooms, nobody knows. Okay. It is let... when it is done in the open, glare, mm. or open view of the public mm. that we can point at it and say this act is a clear violation of the laws of the land. Great. Let me bring in Right, right Reverend Moi uh, Mensa. Section 104 of the Criminal uh, Act, Criminal Offenses Act uh, 1960, Act 29, uh, states unnatural canal knowledge of any. Uh, okay, so it says it is criminal uh, uh, anybody who engages in an unnatural canal knowledge. And then it states that of any animal is guilty of a misdemeanor. Unnatural canal knowledge is a sexual intercourse with a person in an unnatural manner or with an animal. This is, uh, at the moment, what we have in our books that yeah. uh, prevents some of these things. Now, you want a comprehensive legislation. In what form do you want this? I mean, as some say, Section 104 of the Criminal Offences Act deals to some extent um, some of these matters. Well, thank you very much, Aisha. I think it is because our laws are not straightforward on this particular subject. That is why we keep on coming in and out of this situation. During Prof uh, President uh, Kufo's time, this debate came up and um, he was pushed to the wall and he declared as a president his stand. 
Then uh, President uh, Atamils also declared it unequivocally that, listen, they will not subscribe to this. Then John Mahama, President, former President John Mahama, the same. Now it has come to Nana Akufuadu as president. Now, the question is, is if we don't have a well-grounded law to say that this is what we stand for, that the aspect of the same-sex marriage is not acceptable by law, we will keep on dealing with this subject matter regardless of who becomes a president in the near future. Mm. That is why the Christian community, including the religious community, would want to, last, to promote, to have, for us to have a comprehensive law that actually frowns on the same-sex marriage, the concept of the gay and the lesbian, so that it becomes very clear, regardless of who becomes a president in the future. So that is our position. Great. I'll take a break on PM Express. When I return, I'm going to find out how um, these, all these groups uh, wanting the offices of the LGBTQI plus shut and curbing activities of such people, how they intend to push government to heed to their demands. Stay with me. I'm coming right back. Welcome back to PM Express. We've been talking about this conversation, this group of people, LGB, uh, LGBTQ, <laughs> lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender. And we've been talking about what rights they have and whether we should respect those rights or what laws do we have. In fact, what position is Ghana, I mean, it's taking? What's our stance? in this matter. Let me bring you in, uh, Sheikh Arimeyao, quickly on this matter. Now, we're talking about laws and we're talking about religion. Where do you stand on this as to how we should move forward from where we are now? Religion or laws? Our law, even as ambiguous as it appears, has element of prohibition, of criminalization of the act. So, um, to give any institutional structure that can be, that will be allowed to exist is also to give an institutional endorsement of the act that our constitution or our law frowns upon. That would be con contradictory. That is why, from our point of view, one we 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 still expect the government to come out with a clear position on this. Secondly. If there's a need for us to review our law, to make it as comprehensive as to cover all other elements of the same sex. Because, you see, what is worrying that we can see now is, the, the one that I know already is LGBT. Now they have added the Q, the queer, the intersex. And then, I mean, and then they have added the plus. So what it means is that even the scope of this kind of um, sexual depravity, um, it's not even limited to what we know now. And to allow it to expand is to really, 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 really pollute and desacralize our, the space of our family sanctity. And for, for me, it's so important. So we must quickly get the, get the government um, in conformity with our, with our law to get the office closed. We must review the law to cover all other elements of the sexual orientations that we frown uh, upon. Um, if we don't have this happening, I think that through interfaith dialogue, all the religions will have to really come together and see how we can mount the pressure on the government to ensure that these laws uh, are reviewed. Um, I, I understand the, uh, Mr. Frank's position. Yes, I mean, you cannot subject any of the uh, proponents to any physical violence and so on and so forth. But we must also understand that we are a, 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 a country that's governed by law, and we have a law that frowns upon this practice. And our laws derive from our common national identity. We are distinct from citizens of other countries through our cultural identity. Without our culture, we cease to exist. So it's something that binds us together and gives our identity is, is our culture. And our culture totally frowns up, upon it. Our religions frown completely uh, this kind of practice. 
And I want to see the government come out clearly uh, to state a clear uh, position on that. But those offices, in my view, and speaking for Muslims, must be closed immediately. Mm. Reverend Fayasi, how do you intend to push government to heed to your demands? We had a meeting this uh, afternoon, actually, and uh, the plan of action is to issue a number of statements from all the ecumenical bodies and also from the ecumenical bodies put together and as uh, Sheikh said, maybe have one with uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters as well, so that it's from the religious community. But in addition to that, we want to have engagement with the executive, the legislature, the judiciary also on this, on this matter. So uh, we are not only going to give our statements this time, we want to mount that pressure even on, on the legislature to come out with comprehensive legislature to kill this matter once and for all. Um, Sheikh Karimeo has made the point that the offices must be closed now. How urgent is your call? Oh, I think uh, we have been informed that the office had already been closed. The offices of the LGBTQ I plus have been have already been closed. That is the information we got from uh, the executive secretary of the Coalition for Proper Human Sexual Rights and Family Values. A statement issued today by journalists against LGBTQ plus say they've identified that the office is still in operation. Oh, uh, okay. Um, once, once that is verified, which of whatever the case is, we are going to continue to mount pressure. That's why we are going to involve in the engagement with these key uh, offices or legs of government, uh, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Have you had any engagement with the government on this matter? Uh, in the past, yes, but not this current uh, uh, situation. Okay, so what was the response then, which is different from now? Oh, the last one that I can easily easily comes to mind is uh, when the CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education Issue, came up. Um, we had several engagements uh, with uh, arms of government and the presidency, and eventually we prevailed on uh, the Ministry of Education and the Presidency to promise us that uh, uh, the secret agenda to have some of these LGBTQI uh, matters not find their place in our uh, basic education curriculum. So that, 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 and that was done. The government listened. And so we believe that this time around, the government will listen. I'm grateful for your time. Reverend Dr. Cyril Gishon Fayose, is General Secretary of Christian Council of Ghana. John Ndebugri was supposed to join us with the law part of the discussion, but unfortunately, we could not reach him uh, when the time came. Sheikh Arimeo Shaibu is Muslim cleric and spokesperson of the National Chief Imam. Right Reverend Samuel Noy Mensa is member of the National Executive Council, Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council. And Frank Doye is acting uh, country director of Amnesty International. Ignatius Anno is journalist with Euro News and pro LGBTQI activist who is a gay himself. I'm grateful gentlemen that you all joined us. My name is Aisha Ryan. Many thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of our programs.